Welcome to the Shiv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. I'd like to cover a couple of insights regarding the life of King David seen in Psalm 27 and 51. What was King David really saying in Psalm 51 regarding sacrifices? Also, possible evidence of King David's dysfunctional childhood in Psalm 27 and 51. Okay, let's get right to it. I'd like to share an insight that came out of our Shabbat Bible study time. The parasha was Kitavo, and the Psalm of the Week being Psalm 51, a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Read 2 Samuel 11 for the full fascinating story. David had secretly committed adultery with her, resulting in pregnancy. To hide his sin, King David gave the command that caused the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite. The Lord then sends the prophet Nathan to David to get him to face his sins. Read 2 Samuel 12. Nathan tells a story about a little lamb belonging to a poor man that is killed by a rich man to serve his guests. David's response is found in 2 Samuel 12, starting with verse 5. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As Hashem lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Notice that David did judge correctly regarding making restitution for the lamb fourfold. That law is found in Exodus 22, verse 1, and it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep, say, and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep, end quote. As you see, this crime is not punishable by death according to God's holy law. But yet David exclaims, as Hashem lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. His anger makes us wonder if the story hits a trigger spot in David's heart. Christina pointed out during our study time that David shepherded sheep as a young boy. Perhaps something similar happened to a pet lamb of his when he was a child. Just speculation, but it might account for the outburst of rage. Nathan hit a hot button. At any rate, the lamb's story gains his complete empathy and rage. You see, God knows David's backstory. Now that Nathan has gotten the incensed King David to make a judgment, Nathan flings out his finger at David and cries, You are the man. It cuts David to the heart. He feels the crushing weight of his sins. Psalm 51 relates King David's heart-rending cry for forgiveness and restoration. The man knew how to repent once he was willing to admit his sin. Let's discuss for a moment what true repentance is not. True repentance is not tossing out a vacuous blanket statement to God, hurriedly tacked on to the end of a prayer, and forgive me all my sins. Not that it's wrong to pray that request. After all, it is in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive those who have debts or trespass against us. But if all you do is just stop there with an overarching, nonspecific declaration regarding your sins, your prayer is hollow. Why? Because you have not actually confessed the facts of your sin, and that is a ploy. Whether you realize it or not, to spare yourself from admitting that you were wrong and take actual blame. People like the, Lord forgive me all my sins, blanket prayer, because it permits them to keep their pride intact. It enables them to continue in the delusion of not being too bad of a person. Do we really think we are hiding our transgressions from him? Not for one second. We need to drop our pride and get open and honest with our Creator. Humility only hurts the haughty. Being stiff-necked means to be unwilling to bend the neck in humble repentance, where we acknowledge our specific sins before an Almighty God. Here's a good psalm to pray. Psalm 139, starting with verse 23. Search me, O Elohim, and know my heart. Try me, Bachan, it's like testing metal. Try me and know my disquieting, double-minded thoughts, sar apim, and see if there is any wicked way, literally way of pain, in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
Invite the Lord to prune you. It will be worth it. After all, Messiah Yeshua is worthy of having good and faithful servants. It's about Him. The world today is still mired in the quicksand of humanistic mindsets where we are all little gods. With our hefty little heinies plopped on our self-appointed rickety thrones, we survey our decrepit domain, proclaiming, It is good. In our Garden of Hedonism, self-justification and the victim mindset is cultivated. Those who fall for it are robbed of healing and healthy lives. Communities falter. Nations crumble. Weed the truth, water the lie, to quote from my song, The Choice. The truth is, it's not all about us. The other day, I re-listened to Paris Reedhead's Ten Shekels in a Shirt on YouTube. Always leaves me in tears. Now, this message was given in 1956. 1956. Go take a listen. How much farther have we fallen by today, 2021? Heaven help us. We are living in a Laodicean world. Good is called evil and evil good. Last time I checked, I am not the creator. I am not my own savior redeemer. Our creator deserves all, our everything. Messiah Yeshua is the Goel, redeemer, commander, the good shepherd, to name a few titles. Our nation needs to pick our butts up off our useless thrones and fall at his feet begging for mercy, forgiveness, and restoration, and a chance to be his good and faithful servants, all through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Holiness, the Holy Spirit. There is much to confess and pray about this year as we fast on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Pray for true revival, fast for true repentance, and a coming back to walking in covenant faithfulness, what God considers to be covenant faithfulness. Ask him, seek him diligently, and he will let himself be found by you. But not if you're playing games, or if all you want is your comfy brand of religion. You will have to change your inaccurate paradigms. You will have to unlearn lies. It's time for the practice of, quote, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, end quote, to be tossed out. Time to rediscover the Torah in the rubble of the temple. Because Torah, with its commandments, all 613 plus of them, are the lifestyle of the redeemed community. People, this is a covenant thing. Salvation by grace, lifestyle by written Torah. It really is the least we can do. It's our duty. It's our covenant duty. In the end, it will be so worth it. But don't do it for you because of what you will gain. And you will find shalom. But do it for him because he is worthy, worthy, worthy. In Matashahu, Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, But seek first, literally, seek continually, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay, on to our next observation. The story of David's sin with Bathsheba is a well-known one, but part of Psalm 51 is often misunderstood. Listen to Psalm 51, starting with verse 16. David says to God, For you do not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. End quote. Now, many use these verses to support their view of, see, God doesn't want sacrifices. We're not under the law. Jesus' death put an end to all the sacrifices. But closer scrutiny doesn't bear that opinion out. One of my Shabbat Bible study buddies, Christina, pointed out this very key item. One that if you do not study all the commandments found in Genesis through Deuteronomy, you'll miss it. Here it is. According to the Torah, the terms of the covenant, there were no sacrifices that atoned for adultery or murder. The judgment was death. David was as good as dead, and he knew this. He knew what the Mosaic law commanded. As king, he had to write out his own copy of the Torah. 
He understood that there wasn't a sacrifice on the books to cover adultery or murder. The verdict was death. That is why he cries out in Psalm 51, verse 14, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my Teshua, salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will show forth your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice or else I'd give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. He's saying, in effect, Lord, I know the law. I know there is no sacrifice to cover what I've done, and the death penalty awaits me. David himself was a prophet. He knew the specifics of the Abrahamic covenant that was cut between Abraham and God. David knew that Abraham himself did not walk between the cut pieces of the sacrificial animals. The flaming torch and the smoking fire pot walked between the pieces. Abraham was in a deep sleep. God swore by himself. Remember, in the covenant of the cut pieces, the participants would walk between the animals that were cut in half, blood flowing, and they would pledge, if I break the terms of this covenant, may what has happened to these animals happen to me. In, in essence, you can kill me. And also remember that blood covenant once cut is forever. As a prophet, David perceived that if those in the Abrahamic covenant broke that covenant, the prophesied Messiah, one who would come from his own lineage, would die in their place. Remember, God swore by himself. Remember, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. David goes on to share in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of Elohim are a shavar spirit, a shattered spirit, a broken spirit, a shattered and contrite heart, O Elohim, you will not despise. Often the title Elohim is used when God is functioning in the role of divine judge. David knows he needs heavenly help when he cries out in verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O Elohim, the Elohim of my Teshua, my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. David knew he needed the salvation only attained through the sinless Lamb of God, his righteousness. Only Messiah Yeshua can deliver us from the verdict of blood guilt whose penalty is death. He needed the one who walked between the pieces on behalf of mankind. Only that one's blood can wash us white as snow. The blood must be balanced. God's holiness and justice demands it. Unless you confess your sin, placing it under the blood of Messiah Yeshua, salvation, trusting in his work, not yours, you remain in your sin. We will all stand before him one day. If you have not entered in by the narrow way, through the death and resurrection of God's promised lamb, you are not in the lamb's book of life. Other books will then be opened, and you will be judged by the record of your works, and you will be found wanting. God's standard for entrance into his kingdom is perfection, a perfection that can only be found in his Son. If you will not accept our Creator's free love gift of how to get grafted back into the covenant, then you are a broken limb, lying helplessly on the ground. You cannot lift yourself up. The doors will be shut against you. So, while it's still called today, choose Yeshua, choose life, repent, shuv, get specific with God about your sins, then go and sin no more, become born again. In ancient biblical times, to do a mikvah, baptism, was to physically go under the water and up again, signifying rebirth, a change of status, a physical action that reflected an inward change. There are many reasons to do a mikvah in scripture. One type I'd like to discuss here is the mikvah of becoming a Talmud, a disciple of Messiah Yeshua, to be born again. In front of witnesses, repent, confess Messiah Yeshua, acknowledge him as Goel, Redeemer, Savior and Lord of all, then you dunk yourself under the water and up again. I, I know movies show someone dunking you, but that's kind of an invention. To follow Messiah Yeshua is your choice. No one can do it for you. You dunk yourself. Once you come up from the water, you have changed your status. You are now a new creation now a follower of the Lamb, a physical action reflecting an inward change. The ancient mikvot in Israel are designed with steps going down to the water with a divider in the middle 
so that you go up the other side. You don't go back up the way you came in. You go up the other steps, signifying that a status change has occurred. I've personally seen these ancient mikvot in Jerusalem. Remember, in ancient Hebraic biblical thought, the intent is never to sever the body, the physical, from the spirit or the spiritual. Body and spirit are one. They work together here on earth. After death, the spirit returns to God who gave it, awaiting the day of resurrection at the end. If the body didn't matter, then God wouldn't bother giving us new ones, would he? We'd just stay spirit. Okay, next topic. Possible evidence of King David's dysfunctional childhood in Psalm 27 and 51. David of Bethlehem, the shepherd boy who became the king of Israel, from whose lineage would come the Messiah prophesied by Moshe. Listen to the pain in these verses. Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Tehillim, Psalm, Psalms 27, verses 10 and 11. When my father and my mother forsake me, then Hashem will gather me up. Teach me your way, Hashem, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Also, remember in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord sent Samuel to Jesse of Bethlehem to anoint a king from one of Jesse's sons to replace the unfaithful king Saul. Let's read some of this intriguing account. Okay, that's 1 Samuel 16, starting with the first verse. Then he, Samuel, consecrated Yishai, Jesse, and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliav, that's Jesse's firstborn, and said, Surely Hashem's anointed is before him. But Hashem said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For Hashem does not see as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but Hashem looks at the heart. So Jesse then calls Abinadav and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has Hashem chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, Hashem has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So we sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And Hashem said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of Hashem came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. End quote. Wow, notice that David's father did not even consider David worthy to be given an opportunity to be chosen. By excluding David from the sacrifice and the lineup, David's father sends him a clear message of rejection. Sometime after this event, look how David's brothers treat him in the account in 1 Samuel 17. The Israelites are at war with the Philistines, and Jesse, David's father, tells him, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Kind of sounds like Jesse is treating David more like a servant than a son, Cinder David, here, schlep these supplies. So David puts the sheep in the hands of a keeper, takes the supplies to the Valley of Elah, the battlefront. When he gets there, the army was going out to fight. David places the supplies in the hands of the supply keeper and then runs out to the army and to his three oldest brothers, Eliav, Abinadav, and Shema. Okay, picking up with First Samuel 17, verse 23. Then as he talked with him, there was the champion, the Plishtim, Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. 
So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So it shall be done for the man who kills him. Here it comes. Okay, now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? End quote. Probably still smarting from being passed over for kingship, firstborn Eliab belittles David. He charges David of irresponsibility with the sheep, but we know David placed him in good hands before he left. Eliab also accuses David of pride and insolence of heart. Sounds to me that Eliab is projecting onto David what he himself is guilty of. Why does David's family treat him so poorly? When David says, in sin my mother conceived me, this is a clue. It's not a sin to have a baby. So what is David talking about? It appears that David was not the son of Jesse's wife, but of another woman. He seems to be an outcast in his own family and not completely accepted. You also see this when David says in Psalm 27, verse 10 and 11, When my father and my mother forsake me, then Hashem will gather me up, teach me your way, Hashem, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Here in Psalm 27, we see David struggling with his dysfunctional family. David finally relents. Now he reaches up his arms to God and asks him to swoop him up in his arms and become his parent. Teach me your way, Hashem. David is requesting that the Creator reparent him in God's commandments, his ways. The ways of a dysfunctional family bring heartache and chaos. But the ways of God bring healing and shalom, peace. Family may fail us. Friends may not understand us. Society at large may think we're weird. But God will always be at our side as our salvation, our helper, our strong deliverer, our king, our commander, our extraordinary strategist, our parent. After all, it is he who created you and I. Take hope. Pursue his paths, and you'll get your healing as you grow, as you learn to forgive, as you learn to trust and obey. I know, because he is in the process of reparenting me. This has been The Shuv Show. I'm Christine Jackman. Lila Tove. Good night.